اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم صلاۃ وسلام سید محمد والمسلین اجمعین ویلکم ٹو دا نائنتھ اینول ویسٹ کوسٹ اسنا ایجوکیشن فورم ان کولیبوریشن وتھ سسنا اینڈ الدین فاؤنڈیشن I want to welcome our educators all around the country and all around the world. Thank you for joining us today as we begin our very first virtual West Coast Education Forum, Alhamdulillah. I am Azra Nakwi. I'm the member of the West Coast ISNA Education Forum Committee this year and a board member of CISNA, the Council of Islamic Schools of North America. I'm also the president uh, or principal of Hadi School of Excellence in Schaumburg, Illinois. Today, we will begin with our first curriculum and instruction track with the topic of prophetic pedagogy by Sister Rehnuma Asmi and Sister Amara Dikur. Before we begin, I would like to quickly introduce our speakers today. Sister Rehnuma Asmi is an executive board member of CICW and a designer of teacher training program. She receives her PhD in anthropology and education on education reform and multiculturalism in from Qatar. She serves as an assistant professor of religion and education at Algini College. Dr. Asmi's research interests include multicultural and faith-based education, as well as the social cultural effect of education on Muslims, women, and family. Sister Amara Dikur is an executive board member of CISNA as well and a designer of the teacher training program. She's a professional lecturer in the School of Education at American University in, in uh, Washington, DC. Sister Dikur is an education leadership scholar who work uh, focuses on the interaction of leadership, gender, faith, and diverse cultural uh, contexts to advance social justice. Now the topic of this series is focused on teaching mindsets and methodologies of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We look at the ways in which he humanizes his students and approach them as an individual with unique cultures, uh, personalities and background and projects, those as teaching methods for te today's Muslims school educators. So inshallah, we will have time for question and a uh, question and answer session at the end of the program. And you're welcome to post your questions in the chat as we're listening, and we will be reading those out during the question and answer session, inshallah. Just quickly about our Zoom norms. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know, please keep yourself muted and also turn off your cameras to avoid any disturbance during the presentation. And we will invite you to unmute yourself during the uh, question and answer session when you're ready to answer any question. This session will be recorded. If you like to view again and to share, uh, it will be available in ISNA YouTube channel, inshallah. With that, I am honored to introduce and invite Sister Rehnuma and Sister Amara to join us for the presentation. Please welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, uh, Sister uh, um, Aksa Azra, uh, and for having us. Uh, we're very excited to be doing this program. Uh, this is um, a part of a program that we launched last fall um, as a part of the Center for Islam in the Contemporary World at Shenandoah University. And we're so excited to be sharing it here at the uh, West Coast Education Forum. And uh, I'm really impressed by the technological sophistication of this, um, of this Zoom uh, program. And I love the music at the very beginning. And um, it's really great to see so many, so many people from across the country and the world um, be able to come together. It's one of the very exciting things about going virtual that we discovered um, uh, when, we did our, when we did the prophetic pedagogy program in the fall. Um, so Amara and I are going to uh, take turns presenting and we're just going to start off um, with a little bit about, um, about prophetic pedagogy and um, why we decided to create a program for our Islamic school teachers under this heading. Uh, and a lot of the thinking behind it is to explore uh, what does it mean to teach like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So um, 
we've been designing uh, different types of workshops and we have another series coming up in uh, a couple of weeks. And alhamdulillah, we are lucky to have uh, Sheikh Abdullah Idris as our, one of our main um, instructors, as well as Sister Sue Labadi, who is, I, I believe, here with us, and Sister Saja Saleh. And so, you know, we invite you to join us on this journey. And um, we'll be giving you a little taste of what we talk about during the series um, today. So I will uh, hand things off to Amara, and she'll get us started. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, yes, it is uh, my sincere pleasure to also be in this space. Um, a whole lot easier than hopping on an airplane at this time and so excited to be with colleagues on the West Coast that I don't usually get a chance to be in community with. Um, so I'd like to start our conversation this morning or afternoon, depending on what side of the Mississippi you're on, um, with a slide I'm titling, Humanizing is Prophetic Pedagogy. And what I'd like to share with you all is that in preparing for our prophetic pedagogy series, one thing that became very clear to me is that our work as educators is rooted on creating classrooms that center the humanization of one another. And I know that this is true, not just in a typical American classroom, but we know that this is true, particularly in our Muslim and Islamic schools, where we are striving to teach like the prophet. Now, humanizing, I, I understand it has that root word human, which may make one think, oh, it's humanizing, just treating our children as humans, treating our students and ourselves as humans. It's more powerful than that. Humanizing is an active verb that is to validate others' humanity, right? Validating others' humanity. And when you validate others' humanity, you recognize that we come in lots of different forms of diversity, racial diversity, ethnic, gender, age diversity. And when we validate one another's humanity, we validate the way that we show up in the world. We validate our developmental stages. Some of the people that we're teaching are developmentally toddlers. Others are developmentally adolescents and others are developmentally young adults. And we validate wherever our young people are in their stage of development. It means we validate people's strengths and their weaknesses. We validate their previous experiences and their future aspirations. We validate all their different types of personalities, the shy ones, the bold ones, the more hesitant ones. We validate students and others with different levels of understanding of their faith, different ways of embodying their faith. We validate people no matter how they show up in our classroom. And this is an attribute of the Prophet I've learned this by learning so many different hadith that tell me through stories what the prophet was like when he was engaging with others, particularly when he was humanizing others through teaching. So I'll remind you of some of these stories. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with them. One is a story where I can see the image in my own mind as anyone tells it to me. It's that story when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was praying and making sujood and his grandsons were climbing on his back and he stayed in sujood long enough for them to climb off safely before he stood up. And I remember this as an example of teaching where he had an, an, a very unique time to show his grandsons one, the power of prayer, but two, also honoring their developmental stage and development at that time as young children, playful children. I also know that there's stories that Rasulullah wasalam, when he would walk through the community, he would have something sweet in his pocket and encourage people to have something sweet in their pocket for children. I think that honors a child's development, their childlike interest for something sweet and something that captures their attention with you. I also know 
that when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was teaching someone the answer to a very difficult question, a young person came and asked if he could have permission to commit adultery. And this question was asked in front of others. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took that as a teachable moment and said to that young person, would you want that on your mother? Would you want that on your sister, your aunt, your female relatives? And when that young man said no in horror multiple times, he said that nobody would want that for their own daughter, wife, aunt, sister. His ability to teach, no matter how somebody showed up, is an example of humanizing. And there are many other examples that we could draw upon from the Sunnah, but they all remind us that validating one another's humanity is the way we show up as teachers in a classroom. I just want to bring this up and help introduce this conversation of, well, how do we humanize our online classrooms? <laughs> because for so many of us teaching now in this 11th month of a pandemic, we're still teaching online, where Zoom is something that we are very familiar with. So I would like to suggest three specific things that we can prioritize if we want to humanize our online classrooms. One is to build meaningful classroom relationships with our students and between students. Because when we build meaningful classroom relationships with one another, we truly get to know one another. And isn't that the answer to the, to the ayah? He made us into nations and tribes so that we could know one another. Thinking about how to, no, how to navigate technology so that you can build relationships with your students and they can build relationships with one another is an important attribute of humanizing your online classroom. This means trusting students to be in breakout rooms to learn and collaborate together, right? Because when they're working together without you present, they're building relationships with one another. It means finding a way to use technology to have informal conversations with your students. You all know when we were back in a brick and mortar classroom, you would have those relationships with students where it was those quiet moments when one person lingers behind in the line on the way to recess and you have a little conversation with that student. That was, those were the moments when you built those meaningful relationships. So try and imagine how you can have those informalities in the clunky limitations of a Zoom classroom space. And remind yourself to play. Play with your students as a way of building relationships with them. And there are a lot of ways that we can play on Zoom. Use your expert knowledge in child and youth development. Know what children and young people can do online, know what they can't do online, right? And leverage your knowledge of how children develop over time and center that when you're designing your online instruction so that you are humanizing your young people, which may not mean keeping them in front of a Zoom camera for six, seven hours at a time, if you know that that is not how they are developmentally shaped. <laughs> so leverage your knowledge and don't set that aside when you're planning how to teach in your online space. And last, lay the foundation for transformation. When we look at the teaching of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his teaching was pure and simple, to call people to know Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and to obey Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala through love. When we talk about teaching in our classroom, don't get centered and focused on teaching math, science. Don't get focused on teaching English, history, don't even get focused on teaching Arabic. Remind yourself that you are teaching children and the subject matter becomes the bridge through which you lay a foundation for transforming their heart. Use math to get to their heart. Tell stories to get to their heart. Teach them Arabic to get to their heart, but teach to the child so that we can transform the child. And then, then we'll be teaching in the manner of our prophet. Rathnuma, could we move to the next slide? Humanizing in our classroom becomes essential if we're going to teach successfully in times of social change. 
And if you were in the keynote se uh, session a moment ago with Sister Megda, you heard her mention the year of 2020 was a year like no other. We have had a year and continue to suffer under the brutal reality of COVID-19. In the summer of 2020, we saw racial injustice uprisings where people said this is enough. We have been seeing families, Muslim families, neighbors' families who have lost their jobs, who are in financial distress. And now after January 6, we are reminded yet again of the political fragility of our nation. So we are teaching in times of social change and we need to call upon our prophetic pedagogy to get us through this successfully. One, acknowledge these realities in front of your students. You can't teach in a time of social change and not acknowledge the change that's happening around you and acknowledge it in a way that honors the child and human development of the young people you're responsible for teaching. Two, there is nothing we are facing today that Rasulullah did not model for us. To teach the Sunnah, show students how he led his community to navigate through times of difficulty and unrest. Three, engage in social justice, do good deeds. Get your hands dirty, do work to advance justice in your community and teach your students how to practice self-care. Don't set aside the realities that we see on the news that young people today are in high rates of a depression and anxiety. So let's teach them how to care for themselves at this time. And when we do these four things effectively, we will be able to teach our young people in a, in a time of social change in a way that speaks to their heart. But I'll tell you this, these four things that are on the slide in front of you are also what we need to be doing for ourselves. In order for us to mobilize our capacity to teach our young people, we need to acknowledge the realities of the day. We need to draw upon guidance from the Sunnah. We need to be engaging in social justice beyond teaching in our classroom and we need to practice self-care. So what I'd like to show you all on the next slide, I'd like to um, create some way for us to engage with one another. And alhamdulillah, there are 109 of us in this room, but we're going to do this and we're gonna use technology, all right? So my question to you all is this, what can you begin to do to humanize your online classroom? And we're gonna have a conversation with one another but it's going to be through mute. So you have a few ways that you can join this conversation. If you have a, um, a smartphone, you can uh, point it to my QR code on the screen and it's going to bring you to an online Padlet where you can type on an online post-it note, what can you begin to do to humanize your online classroom? Or if you are unable to get to um, if you are unable to get to the QR code, then I'm going to put the link in the chat and ask you to click on this link here where you can access the Padlet. And when you start to share on this Padlet, I'd like you to type in the post-it note what you can begin to do. You can put a heart stamp next to someone else's post-it note if you like what they have to say, or you can put a comment next to what they're saying. Um, and you can navigate to this Padlet post, and I'm going to navigate to this on my screen here, and we'll be able to have a conversation with one another. Oh no, it says you need a login? Oh no. Well, isn't that a technological oopsie? <laughs> that is okay. Because I'll tell you this. Give me just a moment. Okay. Now, 
you should be able to. You should be able to post. And if I have. Tell me if you're seeing in the chat because I closed the chat on my screen. Is it behaving better now or is it still not behaving? Sister Amara, they're asking if they can just use the chat box instead if it doesn't work. Yes. Absolutely. Because um, if we're going to model excellent online instruction, then we're going to be aware of uh, what this looks like here. I'll tell you this, while we use the Padlet, uh, excuse me, while we use the chat box to answer this question, what can we do to humanize our online classroom? I'll tell you this, Padlet is a free online tool that allows you to post post-it notes on a virtual bulletin board and it allows people to comment on those post-it notes and react to those post-it notes. And as now you can see, there's a secret little button that makes something private that I accidentally pushed that's not allowing you all to get in it. But just hold that website on your notes, padlet.com, because it would be a great tool for you to consider bringing into your online classroom spaces. All right, so we will look to see who is able to post to the chat what can you do to begin humanizing your online classroom? Thank you, Shaheen. Yes, teaching students to engage in self-care is absolutely essential to humanizing your online classroom. Anyone else want to put in the chat some other ideas? Great. Listening to the students, allowing them to share, having students share personal stories, being like their friend. Yeah, when it's about building meaningful relationships with students, keeping that separation between teacher and student is essential. But yes, being friendly with our students is so necessary when validating their humanity. Rathnuma, as people continue to post to this chat, would you like to move to the next slide? Sure. Um, so um, this is a great, um, place to transition and think about uh, one of the key components of prophetic pedagogy, which is storytelling. And Amara does this so seamlessly um, that I am always um, so, mashallah, impressed um, by how she incorporates stories into her teaching presentations. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, many of you are also sharing ways that, you know, stories can help you connect with your students. Uh, I think someone mentioned using a personal story to uh, share what you uh, what you learned or what you're personally, how you're personally dealing with something. So we're going to be talking about storytelling as prophetic pedagogy. And um, I'm going to be using the story of Revelation to illustrate what we mean uh, when we talk about, um, about becoming how we model or how we're trying to teach like the prophet. And in this case, we're actually looking at the prophet as learner. So many of you, uh, most of us are familiar with the first, uh, the first verses of Revelation. And the story behind the, the, this, these first few verses um, actually is, uh, happens when the Prophet Sayyidim is in a retreat um, in the cave of Hira. And the Prophet, um, the angel Jibril comes upon him and he says to him these words, recite in the name of your Lord. And um, these, this is the way that he, you know, is initially um, challenged to, uh, to prophecy, but he's scared and um, he actually misunderstands what the uh, angel is asking him to do because Iqra can be translated or understood as either to read or to recite or to proclaim as it's, um, as it's translated here in the verses on the screen. So we have, uh, you know, all of these interpretations that the prophet is having of what the angel Jibril is asking him to do. And, and he interprets his request as to read. And he says, the prophet says, I am not, I, I cannot read because he was illiterate. And um, what does the angel do? He 
squeezes the prophet, or he hugs him, and he says, he repeats it. He says, again. And he does this a third time. So this shows that repetition is really important to the learning process. And if you don't get it the first time, you have to try at least, in this case, he's trying three times. The angel is requesting three times that the prophet recite. And at the at finally, the prophet understands and he says, he repeats after him and he says, And as we know from the Hadith tradition, he goes um, back to his wife, Khadija, and he says, cover me, cover me. He's she's shaken by this experience. And, um, and this shows that he's physically, when we learn something new, we actually have physiological responses. And we feel like we're being asked to do something that we don't, we can't do. And there's an element of fear. And I think we should acknowledge this in the learning process that oftentimes our students are maybe not paying attention or not engaging because they're scared and they're not sure they can do what we're asking them to do. And Khadija comforts him and he, she takes him to his uncle, her uncle Waraka bin Nofal, who is a, a Christian monk who's well-versed in the Hebrew tradition. And Waraka tells, uh, um, asks the prophet what happened. And then once the prophet shares the story of how the angel visits him, he is, uh, he tells the prophet, you know, this is what happened to Moses as well. And if I live to see, if I live to see your prophecy, I will support you. And, and so what this shows is that when we don't understand something or when we're learning something new, we really need a kind mentor and somebody who is able to give us um, some direction in, in, uh, in, a, in this time of uh, uncertainty or in this time of growth that we're having. So this story of Revelation shows, illustrates the prophet sharing what it's like for him, what it was like for him to uh, receive revelation and to become, um, become a part of this tradition of prophecy and how difficult it was for him um, to, to accept that, you know, he was being chosen because he felt, you know, he didn't know how to read, he was illiterate and um, he was scared. I mean, what would, what would this mean for him if he was being asked to do this, uh, this task of prophecy, this role of, of prophecy? So I think it's, it's really amazing that our religious tradition begins with these verses of uh, in, the su in, in Surah Iqra, you know, we are being asked um, to recite and proclaim um, in an oral fashion our tradition is very oratorical and oral. We're, we're not people of just written material or the book. And um, we're, but we're also encouraged to, to learn by the pen and to read and, and to engage in, in more formal learning. But our, our tradition respects both. It respects the body and it respects the mind. And it respects the fact that we are uh, as Amara was talking about, we're human beings and we have all these different elements that we need to tie together in our worship and in our acknowledgement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our creator. So we really want, um, you know, prophetic pedagogy, when we're looking at it, we really, we're really excited by what we're finding in terms of how, when we look in, into the prophetic tradition, how much there is in terms of uh, knowledge about actual learning, learning methods and teaching styles. Um, and so we're going to, uh, I'm going to break down a couple of more uses of storytelling and we go more into depth in this topic in our series. But um, for example, you can use storytelling to begin classes or units with themes. Um, and one, uh, one thing that one, one hadith that comes to mind is the hadith of Jibreel when he comes to the prophet and he tests him about the definition of Iman, Islam and Ihsan. These are like almost thematic units, you know, he's introducing him to larger themes in this teaching, in, in this teaching experience. So, um, you know, stories are really powerful ways to sort of set the framework for what we're trying to accomplish. Another way that um, one of you mentioned is sharing personal stories to connect with your students. And the Prophet Sayyidunam has um, Masha has so many different stories that we can connect with. Uh, one that comes to mind for our particular time period is, is his uh, journey with loss um, 
and grief. He was a man who lost many people he loved um, throughout his life. And in particular, there's a story of how, when he, he loses his, his son, Ibrahim. And um, one of the, uh, and he's very mournful and, and he's very sad. And one of his um, companions asks him, you know, you tell us not to uh, mourn or be too tearful when we, when we lose someone. And he says back to him, actually, no, you should, because it's uh, a sign of a kind heart and a gentle heart. But he meant that we should not be excessive in our uh, in our mourning, or tear our clothes, or you know, curse uh, curse people, or all this kind of for what has happened to us. So even a, a story like that, it's a very personal story, but it's very powerful, and it teaches you lessons about um, about grieving, about loss, um, and um, also about balance, uh, about how to deal with things in a, in a wise and balanced way, even when you are emotional, not to let the emotions uh, overtake you. Another great way to use storytelling is to create a story about your class and the journey that you're on. Um, and, the, and the Quran itself is a compendium, of, a compendium of, of many, many stories of believers, of different, of believers at different times and in different places and the struggles that they faced. And we're, we're, in, we're invited to take a journey on, uh, with, with the believers and to see what are the challenges that lay ahead for believers. Uh, there are people who don't believe. There's, uh, a lot, there's challenges in terms of our wealth, in terms of loss, in terms of struggle. Um, but then there are also rewards. So make, use storytelling to create a narrative about your classroom, about who you are, what you're about. What are you trying to do and in the classroom setting? Um, and who, who, who are the heroes? Who are the villains? What are the, what are the struggles that you go through? Um, another great way to use storytelling is to deal with disciplinary issues. And um, there's the hadith of the Prophet uh, of when he dealt with the man who was urinating in the masjid. And one of the things that, the, uh, that many people have noted is that he doesn't Many of his Sahaba want to stop the man immediately, but he lets him finish. And then he reminds him what the purpose of the masjid is for. It's for Quran, it's for prayer. And then he has uh, somebody clean up the mess. So, you know, this is a, a very clear sign of how to discipline somebody. You don't, um, you don't forcefully rebuke them. You don't, you know, go after them in front of everybody. And he uses that moment to reinforce the story of what the masjid is about. The masjid is about prayer. It's about Quran. So when we discipline a particular child for something, don't make the story about, uh, about a challenge, about the student challenging your authority. Return everybody in the, in the classroom setting to the purpose of what the classroom is setting is for. Why are we here? What are we trying to accomplish? And uh, what is the purpose of all of this? So again, storytelling can be another framework for sort of returning or reminding everyone about what the purpose is of you know, who we are and what we're here for. Another great technique for storytelling is using your own students as characters in word problems, in storyboards, in um, even science experiments. <laughs> so you know, incorporating them as characters in, in the story of your class classroom. So these are just some ideas for how to use storytelling in the classroom. And, um, you know, I think that, you, you know, we'll get, uh, we'll get a sense of it uh, more in the next example that uh, we want to share with you. So um, we want to give you a chance to engage again. Um, and uh, uh, we can see the story. Um, and many of us are familiar with the story. And think about what topics uh, we could address using this story. So this is the story of when Abu Bakr and the Prophet Sayyidina were in the cave hiding from uh, those who were after them. Um, and uh, they were fleeing to Medina because they were the community of believers, early believers were being persecuted in Mecca. And uh, Abu Bakr says to the Prophet, if one of them were to look down, they would see us under their feet. Meaning they were so close. They were right next to the cave. And in, in the tradition, we know that there was a spider web right outside the cave 
and the men passed by because they uh, thought, you know, no one could be in this cave because there's still this intact spider web. So the Prophet Sallallahu reminds Abu Bakr, oh, Abu Bakr, what do you think of two with whom Allah is the third? So, you know, this is a very rich story and I think it has a lot of different things that you could teach using it. Um, so we wanted to give you a chance to use the technology as uh, again and to connect. And this one's called Pole Everywhere. And Amara has uh, posted the link in the chat so if you can go to the, um, to the website, you can write down in one word or two words what you think you could teach using this story. So Amara, um, is, you've already posted the link, correct? Yes, the link is working. I've already seen some people start to post connections to this story, mashallah. So whenever you, if you would like to, um, what I can do is put in the chat, the website that people will go to, to see the beautiful piece of word art that we're creating. Okay. Um, so you can share, right? So what, some of the things that Amara and I brainstormed, one was trust, um, and um, Amara, was there another point that you thought the story really showcased well? Well, I can tell you that we have so many responses now, mashallah, on the screen. We have so many people typing in connections to stories of trust, courage, resilience, friendship, strength, tawakkul, education, patience, Mashallah. We have some great contributions here. And when you all look on the second link that I've posted in the chat, and I'll post it here again, you can join me in looking at the beautiful word cloud that we're all creating by adding words to this um, Poll Everywhere site. This is another free site that's available to you all um, to help uh, with your online instruction. Do you want to share the graphic, Amara? Or would you like I can't to? share it, but yeah, I put that link in the chat. Okay, um, I can pull it up, I think. Mashallah. Yeah, these are great. So yeah, we have character. Um, as you can see in live time, as more people add, the, like, the, num the words change in shape and grow in terms of to show how many people have inputted that response. Friendship for sure. I actually thought of nature, um, nature as a friend, as a support. So how the natural world kind of supports us uh, and helps human beings um, and helps us on our spiritual, spiritual journey. Yeah, this is a great technique and tool um, that Amara Mashala uses often, uh, has shown me how to use, <laughs> I'm very lucky to have that, um, have that tool. Um, I'm just gonna go back and um, I'm gonna try to stop sharing because, or share, share my slideshow again. So how are we doing on time um, from the- We're doing great. We should be right at the time now for our Q and A. Okay, awesome. So Amar, did you want to show the Padlet or do you want to go ahead into Q&A? No, I'd be happy to. Um, I am going to put that link um, right here in the chat. And then you all are welcome to join me in looking at this beautiful Padlet. We've even had someone figure out how to post an image to the Padlet. It's gorgeous. You all have some great ideas of ways that you can humanize young people in an online classroom space. And I hope that you can use these ideas to motivate one another and share some great practices. None of us are new to online teaching, but all of us would benefit um, from some new options. Mashallah. Very nice. 
So we have from our humanizing as prophetic pedagogy, we have remembering that students love to speak about their own experiences. And then as a teacher, you can call to mind a part of a story shared to connect during a lesson. Calling their name specifically is great when sharing. Um, yeah, I like this example as a connection between both humanizing and storytelling. These are really great, uh, great examples. So as we're sharing the Padlet, please feel free to uh, begin um, requesting or asking questions or making any comments that you have um, about, uh, about these two themes of humanizing as well as storytelling. Thank you so much, Sister Rehnuma and Sister Mara. Um, those were some amazing um, examples of different technology that you've used and also different ways that we can connect to our students, uh, alhamdulillah. Um, we would like to say, take questions. If you have any, please post it into the chat and we'll be reading those questions for you. Um, I'm having a slight technical difficulty, so I'm just going to, um, is there a way for somebody else to share their screen? While you're working on that, I'll answer Sister Sue's question. Um, there's a question in the chat, how can people learn more, um, uh, learn more about prophetic pedagogy? One, I invite all of you to join our winter series. We're going to be starting a 10 part series the first week of February. I put the registration link in the chat. Um, in this um, series, we will, be we will be producing an ebook, a digital workbook for participants, which will have um, resources that we're sharing in the session as well as um, additional resources that people can go um, to learn more about this particular topic. And then there's a question from um, Core Classroom, uh, Dr. Nasreen Khan, how can humanization be implemented during differential, uh, or maybe that's different um, teaching? So I, if I understand this correctly, um, when you're, the question is how do, how do we do humanization? How do we implement humanization during different teaching, uh, either different teaching settings or different teaching situations? And I think the, the word that Rathnuma used earlier, mindset, is critical to doing this work effectively. Humanizing our classroom needs to be a central mindset when we come into the classroom as the educator responsible for that space. That when we are validating, actively validating the diverse representations of humanity that show up in our young people, we're not blaming them for how they show up. We're not punishing them for who they are and how they are or are not developing. Um, we are celebrating how they show up and validating that and teaching them in that moment at that time. And as many of you have probably experienced in this past year of being in quarantine, the way we show up on a day-to-day -day basis changes radically. Um, it could be a very, very great day, mashallah, like waking up and knowing today was Isna West Coast Forum, or it could be a very challenging day, as in yesterday when my motherboard broke on my computer and I realized I had a technology problem. Um, so just as we have these ups and downs, um, our young people are having the same. So I think that the best resources I would say is maintain a humanizing mindset. Um, Rathnuma, can you take the next question here um, from Afra? I'm interested now in looking into the Quranic perspective of learning. Can you share anything about that? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, Amara actually has a session about uh, Ghazali's guidance for teachers. And we think uh, a lot about how in Islam, we're asked to not just understand something or not just 
have knowledge, but to think about action and th think about what that knowledge does. Oftentimes in the Western, uh, Western academic space, uh, knowledge is often valued for itself and um, theories abound about how we can do things and what we can, can or can't do. But in the Islamic tradition, we are very practical and application-based, and we're really interested in what is useful and what is helpful to humanity and to human beings in, in practice. So I think, um, you know, there's always a, a cycle of sort of not, uh, knowledge and then understanding, deepening that knowledge, and that's where the example of the story of Revelation is very powerful where the repetition, and, and that's where there's, we talk a lot about the wisdom of repetition and Quran memorization and why that's embedded in our practice, because we're very much about embodiment and, and embodiment in the sense that we model and we're actively modeling uh, the characteristics that we want to see, uh, the character that we wanna see in our students. Uh, and it's a heavy, it's a heavy ask. And, and we talk about that too, about the, the challenges of, uh, of, this, uh, of this prophetic pedagogy of what is being asked of us as Islamic school leaders and teachers um, and why we need to model that practice of returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of practicing uh, of patience and patient perseverance uh, and prayer and, and, and going back to the source of all things so that we are replenished in our ability to sustain um, the, this type of uh, modeling, uh, active modeling of, of what it means to be uh, a person of, uh, of sincerity, of humility, uh, of, so, of someone who, act, who cares about what's happening to our students um, and is not, not, uh, not, a, not in the pursuit of, of, of self-aggrandizement. Like we're not here to sort of be self-promoting ourselves uh, simply for the sake of um, feeling good about ourselves, but we want to do some good. We want to have an impact in the world around us. Um, so I think the, there's a lot of great chronic um, examples of this and, and analogies of how we do, how the, how the, the Quran teaches us about analogous, analogous thinking, about using logic, about uh, observation of the natural world, um, and for practical purposes um, so that we can uh, do something good with it in the end. I hope that answers your question. And I guess it just, we only have a few seconds remaining. I wanna acknowledge um, the comment in the box about the importance of social emotional learning and drawing upon our Islamic foundations to do that work effectively in our schools um, and invite all of you to go to our website to see what we are intending to host in our winter series. And we invite all of you um, and the educators from your respective schools to join us where we hope to share more resources. And just as the previous comments have said, prophetic pedagogy um, is much more expansive than simply storytelling um, and building relationships in the classroom. And so we're hoping that we'll be able to use the time um, and we've got some high class guest speakers that are going to be joining us. One of them is on the um, Zoom room in here now, uh, Sister Sulabadi. And we're really excited to um, spend a good 10 sessions working on um, prophetic pedagogy with all of you. Yes, uh, Sister Azra, I think you're muted maybe. So. Sister Rehnuma and Sister Mara, I want to again, thank you so much for giving us this enlightening uh, presentation about the prophetic pro pedagogy and the real connection that we can make to our students based on the stories and based on the, the examples of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I have seen so much dialogue in the chat uh, and in the Padlet about how we can connect, connect with our students and SubhanAllah. And I'm hoping that the participants have learned a lot from, from what the presentation is. So Jazakallah Khair, uh, Sister Rahinuma and Sister Mara. May Allah bless you for your presentation. Jazakallah Khair. Thank you so much for having us. We really enjoyed this opportunity to connect and to see the good work of the wonderful work that the West Coast Education Forum is doing to connect teachers um, and school leaders. 
Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you for thank including you. us. Thank you so much, Zakala. Our next presentation will be at 11.05, inshallah.